Hey Roots family, Pastor Ashita here. So I'm going to pick up where we left off last week. Last week, I encouraged us to think about our own personal exoduses. What are things that we have left or that God is asking us to leave? And I talked about some emotions that we may be feeling when we are presented with an exodus um, that, that I kind of saw in the first half of Exodus um, that, I've, I, that I felt like tracked with the experiences of Moses and the Israelites. Um, and so I invited us to look at five different emotions and then I gave us a little bit of homework and I really hope that you were able to watch The Prince of Egypt this past week. Um, I know it wasn't streaming for free anywhere but some of us kind of pulled our resources together. I know Janie had some people over on Thursday night um, and that was amazing and I hope that you get a chance to watch it. You have actually another week to watch it before uh, Pastor TC picks up next week and continues on our campfire series. So we are looking at stories in the Bible that uh, that were meaningful to us as we were coming to faith, that we've had to look at with new eyes, with adult eyes, with grown up eyes. And this process of looking at something as a grown up um, has been commonly called deconstructing. So now, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, like what exactly is deconstructing and what does it mean to reconstruct our faith? We have a whole sermon series called Refined, where we, where we deconstructed some common things that um, we were taught as younger believers, as new believers, oftentimes as children, and now we're looking at it with different eyes. And so we're doing something similar with Campfire, but we're doing it with the stories of the Bible. And like I said, for me, the most impactful stories of the Bible um, were the ones that, that are found in Exodus. Moses being saved and put in the Nile and the Pharaoh's daughter saving him and pulling him out and raising him as her own. Um, Moses realizing that he's an Israelite and making the choice to kill an Egyptian because he was treating an Israelite, an enslaved Israelite um, harshly. Moses wandering in the wilderness. Wa Moses being a shepherd, the burning bush, the plagues, the Red Sea, the Passover. Those were out of order, but all of those were super meaningful to me as a young believer. And one of the things that I was thinking a lot about is how I was how I chose to raise our children and talk to them about the Bible and talk to them about these stories. And for me, I really it was really important for me to um, constantly be inviting my children to um, look for Jesus. So this is one of the reasons why we've been reading the Jesus Storybook Bible this uh, summer, um, because I feel like it's so important to to teach my children to look for Jesus and look for evidences of Jesus all around them. And one time uh, that was part of our everyday routine where we did this was I had a lullaby playlist um, that were, that had songs that were just inviting the, the kids to, to be in awe of God, to look for the love of Jesus, and I would play that lullaby playlist for them. Well, one of the things that I have also been thinking about this week, uh, in addition to like how I was raising my children, was how um, while my kids were really young and TC was in seminary, one way that we made extra money was I would I would keep kids because I was already home with little ones. And so um, I used to have several children in my care in addition to mine. And um, one of those kids uh, was particularly precious to me. His name was Isaiah. And, uh, and he and his mom um, actually was not a person of faith. Um, but she really, she, she and I got along really well. Um, I really loved her. She was working um, to be a music therapist. Um, she was attending Harvard and she was a single mom. Um, and, you know, she and I had conversations about like, okay, how, how much is too much in terms of me talking about faith? Or like, I would put my kids in a VBS program and I asked like, could Isaiah go? And um, those kind of things. And she was totally okay. I would say she was more um, agnostic than she was antagonistic. She just had a lot of questions and she didn't really feel like as a black woman she fit into evangelicalism anymore. Um, and so one day we were talking, uh, I was talking with the kids and getting them ready for nap time and um, 
and I was just going to just put them down. They were all really exhausted and I also had another kind of like classical music playlist that I would play um, if it were other kids or kids in my care whose parents were not okay with that playlist. Um, but one of my kids asked for the playlist, asked if I could play uh, play it for them and uh, and I knew that Isaiah's mom was would be okay with him hearing that song the songs on that list so I was like sure it's one of the first times I'd ever you know played that playlist with Isaiah and so I played it fell asleep it was super sweet I went downstairs folded laundry I think I watched Mean Girls I can't remember but later on the kids were with me and um and isaiah was about three or four at that time the kids were all with me and we were um kind of just like reading books and just like they were playing and um and i asked them did you guys have a good nap time like did you how did you sleep during nap time i think maybe like one like trinity was putting her dolls to sleep or something so i just thought you know let's have a conversation how that went for them and uh, Isaiah was like, it was so good. Does God sleep when we sleep? And I was like, oh my gosh. And so I explained to him like, God, oh, no, God never, God doesn't sleep. God, God is always watching over us and taking care of us. And then Tyson with his little like surly, like ornery self was like, ooh, is God creeping on us while we're sleeping? And then it took us into a whole nother conversation. But I thought it was so sweet for for Isaiah to ask that question because sometimes I even in my own mature faith wonder is God sleeping is God paying attention is God around when I take my foot off of the gas is there somebody else driving us forward what does it mean for for me to believe that God sees and God is engaged and God is with me and that for me was the driving question for my deconstruction. I wanted to know, how do I believe in God? How do I, how do I, sh how do I pay attention to my spiritual formation if I don't believe that God sees and that God is aware and that God cares? You know, when I feel like God is asleep, sleeping on the job of, of, of protecting and nurturing and loving his creation. I wonder if that's how the Hebrews in, in Exodus felt, that God had been asleep, that God was sleeping on the job of protecting and nurturing and caring for them, his chosen people. Maybe they felt like God was like, you know what, I need my own lullaby playlist. I'm gonna just, you know, lay down for like a couple of, a couple of hundred years. I wonder if they felt like God had forgotten them and I, and I know why they would feel like that. Because for them, life was really hard. When I went through my deconstruction, I was at probably my lowest point in terms of mental health, physical health, financial health, relational health. Everything seemed to be falling apart all at once. For the Hebrews, their experience was that they were beaten by Egyptian taskmasters masters, and they were forced to do backbreaking work to build pharaoh cities and monuments to idol gods. They were stripped of their inherent worth, their imago Dei, their image of God. They were humiliated. They were exploited. They were taken advantage of, they were beaten and spat upon and treated as less than. Not even secondary citizens, nothing more than chattel than livestock. They were nothing but beasts of burdens as far as the Egyptians were concerned. They were just bodies that were, that were producing a resource that was fulfilling a service. So many Hebrews died because of the harsh treatment on their bodies and their minds, because of the cruelty of the Egyptians. And part of it was because the Egyptians didn't care about their lives. They didn't matter to them. There were so many Hebrews and they were having children. And in spite of all these hardships, they continued to find a way to find family and community and be connected to each other to flourish and multiply. 
And Pharaoh himself was even threatened by their resilience. And because of this, Pharaoh began the first recorded Holocaust in Jewish history. So what he did then was he increased their labor. He made it even more difficult for them. And, and they, they, that didn't slow the growth of the Hebrews. So then he ordered that every boy to be born was to be thrown, every boy that was born was to be thrown into the Nile River and drowned. The situation in Egypt was unthinkable. And it must have felt like to them that God had let them down. And that God was asleep. That he had forgotten them. There are times in our lives, too, that we may feel like God has forgotten us. And we begin to ask ourselves questions about what we believe about God. Is it even safe to believe in God? What do we teach our children about God? How do, we, how do we have relationships with people who were a part of our lives when we were so sure that God was present? Now in this season, we were not sure and they're still, they still have some version or some, some kind of surety. How do we be in relationship with them? There are a lot of questions that come up when we allow ourselves to look at the hardship of our lives, when we allow ourselves to be honest about the hardship of our lives. We all know what it's like to feel afraid. We all know what it's like to feel defeated. We all know what it's like to ask ourselves, where is God? And that is one of the reasons why the Exodus account is so important to me. It's so incredibly important to me. As I look back at the stories that I learned as a child with adult eyes, having gone through a season of deconstruction and reconstruction, the Exodus account is just vital for me in staying the course as a misfit on a mission, finding my identity in Jesus. You see, this Exodus account is not just a history lesson of God's chosen people. It is our story as well. It's a story that speaks to us because the story embodies the struggles that we all experience in our lives. It's the story of being a misfit, someone who is different, someone whose actions and behavior and even choices makes them odd or even an outcast. I've often thought about this church, Roots Covenant, as a safe haven for the outcasts who have wandered a few times and who have wondered a few times, where is God? Is God asleep? And what I've learned in so many conversations with not just our church family, but others who feel like they are misfits too, is there is a comfort in understanding how and why we got here. Meaning if you can confidently communicate how and why you're comfortable with being a misfit, then it's easier for you to deal with some of the pain and struggles. If you, if you are more confident and comfortable in painting the picture of God as loving and for you, it is easier for you to endure the times where God feels distance, distant because you know God's character. Like in my last message, I said there are a few themes that we see in the Exodus account that really resonate with me on my journey of deconstruction and reconstruction, and I hope they will for you as well. Because in a lot of ways, the Israelite story of oppression into Exodus is many of our stories. We have, like I said, a fancy word for it, theological deconstruction. In his article, Deconstructing Faith, Meet the Evangelicals Who Are Questioning Everything, Sam Haley's says, academics have dubbed it theological deconstruction, but in simple terms, they're referring to what happens when a person asks questions that lead to the careful dismantling of their previous beliefs. Theological deconstruction is simply asking questions. He goes on to say, some talk about it as a mid-faith crisis, where deeply held doctrines are re-examined and sometimes jettisoned in favor for more progressive ideas. Many continue to self-identify as Christian throughout this time. Others take on another label, which they say carries less baggage, such as follower of Jesus. I like how uh, Father uh, Richard Rohr goes on to kind of describe the deconstruction process <laughs> in the podcast uh, called The Deconstructionist. So this is what Richard Rohr says. Picture three boxes. The first is order, 
The second is disorder. The third is reorder. We're all raised in the first box of order. We were given our explanation of what reality means and what God means. It gives you so much comfort that most people want to stay in that first box forever. But what has to happen between your 30s and 50s is the glib of certitude, certitude of the first box has to fall apart. Who's right? Who's wrong? Who's holy? And who's a sinner? I know these beliefs gave your ego great comfort, but if you stay inside the first box, it creates angry people, rigid people, and unhappy people. When you leave the first box, it feels like dying. When I, have to leave my, when I had to leave my early Catholic certitudes, it felt like a loss of faith. But that wonderful early evangelical gospel holds you strong enough to endure the second box and not throw the baby out with the bathwater. In the second box, you realize it wasn't as simplistic as I was told, but it's not all wrong either. If you can let God lead you through the second box while hanging on to order, God can lead you to the third box, reorder. People want the first box at all costs, but it doesn't make them love Jesus, the crucified one who identifies with the poor and tells the outsider, never have I, so found, never have I found such faith in Israel. You see why they killed him. He was so comfortable with disorder inside of his own highly ordered religion but he never throws it out. He still respects the temple, but he doesn't waste much time there. That's the position we're in. I live with that tension, figuring out what is good about the tradition I was given and what was accidental and arbitrary. Theological deconstruction is a type of exodus, a departure, usually one that changes everything about your lived experience which is why I take great comfort in learning how to move from order, disorder, and reorder from the Israelite misfits on their own very real exodus. So the five emotions or experiences I mentioned in my last message are defiance, despair, discouragement, discernment, and determination. And I'm going to throw a couple of more in there as I am outlining them for us. But let's look briefly at how the people in Exodus navigated these emotions. First, let's talk about defiance. So in Exodus 1, 15 through 22, we learn of a, of a couple of women who modeled defiance beautifully. I'm going to read it for us. Then the king of Egypt told the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Sapphira and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth, look at the child when you deliver it. If it is a boy, kill it. But if it, but if it is a girl, let it live. However, the midwives feared God and didn't obey the king of Egypt's orders. They let the boys live. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. He asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are so healthy that they have their babies before the midwives arrive. God was good to the midwives. So the people increased in number and became very strong. Because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people to throw into the Nile every Hebrew boy that was born, but let the girls live. Uh, Kelly Nikandiha, Kelly Nikandiha, author of Defiant, What the Women of Exodus Teach Us About Freedom, says, what Pharaoh demanded went against everything in the midwife code, which is all about healthy live births complete with wiggling wet babies and weeping mothers. These two women were named otherwise. Sapphira for beauty, Pua for the essence of childbirth. They were meant to be bearers of beautiful children, as the Hebrew language reveals. So they conspired. Let's, they decided to subvert the power of Pharaoh with their own two hands. When the Hebrew women labored and the babies crowned, the midwives refused to look at the baby's gender. Boy or girl, they delivered healthy infants into the hands of waiting mothers. The story says they let the boys live. In the end, deliverance was in the hands of Pharaoh. Kelly goes on to say, Pharaoh was enraged. When he questioned Sapphira and Pua, he, they simply reminded him of the strength of the Hebrew women. They push out these babies before we can even arrive to look, they said. 
these mighty midwives would not be strong armed into suppressing their people. Instead, they devised a subversive strategy. Devote, devoted to God, they defied Pharaoh. They didn't distinguish between genders, but delivered baby after baby after baby. The power was in their hands and they wielded it for life. Oftentimes, when we begin our deconstruction, it is because of life, because actual human life is at stake. We begin to question the goodness of God when there's so much suffering. We begin to speak out against policies and leaders who ignore the pain of people suffering from addiction or systemic prejudice. We ask our church leaders to be held accountable for harm that they've been complicit in, harm to women, children, queer, pe queer and disabled people. Like the midwives, our exodus springs forth from a deep sense of justice and a defiance to anything that challenges the picture of God as life giver, essence of beauty, creator of goodness. We even see this defiance a bit when Moses comes to term with his cultural identity as an Israelite and murders an Egyptian who was treating an enslaved Israelite harshly. In the defiance of, of the violence, in defiance of the violence of Egypt, Moses enacted violence, which I think is a caution to us, misfits. We must be careful in our defiance to not become the thing we hate when we are on our journey to a flourishing faith. Let life and love be our guide. The next emotion is despair and discouragement. The next two emotions are despair and discouragement. While some of us come to deconstruction with a strong sense of justice, some come with deep despair, hopelessness, and a sense of abandonment. Maybe we feel like the Israelites in Exodus too. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose to God. God heard their groaning. God looked upon the Israelites and God took notice of them. Once comfortable and thriving in the land of Goshen, when a new Pharaoh came, the Israelites uh, began to experience a new world of pain. They were once a free and powerful people living in the best part of Egypt. But then they became enslaved and oppressed and forced to meet impossible standards, impossible quotas. Oftentimes when the novelty of deconstruction wears off, or we come to deconstruction with this deep sense, this deep pain. Maybe when we've spent a long time wandering, like in a new land like Moses, we have to stop and reckon with that pain. We cannot build something beautiful and new without looking at the ugly and hard and, and allowing God to heal that. Because if we are not careful in the rebuilding, there will be traces of that pain. And we may accidentally enact that pain onto other people. So a part of our deconstruction has to be a bravery, a courage to acknowledge our deep despair and our discouragement. We have to be able to say that we are hurting and that we are in pain and that we have questions. And that is why at Roots we make space to say, you don't have to have your stuff figured out. We are all misfits on a mission. We are all a little bit messy. Come be messy with us. I love that in Moses' reckoning with his despair and his discouragement, as he was realizing that he had this new identity, that he was a part of this culture and this heritage he knew nothing about. Maybe even being raised in an Egyptian household, he had some internalized hate, some hatred towards the Israelites that now he's among them and he's working through that internalized hatred. What I love is that as he is working out and working through his, dis his despair and his discouragement, he does it in the refuge of the Midianites. The Midianites were among the nomadic tribe of the Israelites. According to Genesis, the Midian Midianites were descendants of Midian, who was a son of the Hebrew patriarch Abraham. So this means that these people knew Yahweh. And it's quite possible that in the desert, with on the move, encountering different people of different cultures, 
being living lives that are connected to the earth by caring for livestock. In this in this space and in this way, the Midianites were able to to have a, a contextualized expression of their of their identity as Israelites. Moses could work through his despair and his discouragement, the despair of his lost identity, the despair of not knowing who or where he belonged, the despair of harm done as he comes to term with this true heritage, with these people who have contextualized their faith. Most of us know this despair, especially when we've deconstructed. I believe Moses running to a group who could show him their different contextualized way of, of living out their faith gave him hope and can give us hope. This is why I love Roots so much. We are like the Midianites for the Moseses of the world. We are a group of people who love Jesus and we want to encourage each other to love him wholly in a contextualized and a restorative way because there are so many people who are reckoning with their despair and their discouragement and they're doing it on their own. The next emotions that we're gonna process are doubt and discernment an emotion and a practice. So in the process of discernment, at some point we begin to ask questions. What now? Is this all there is? Oftentimes when this question comes up, we have successfully detoxed, detoxed some of the harmful ways of thinking and practicing our faith and we have embraced a more flourishing faith. We are building our faith on life and love. We have looked at those hard feelings, those hard emotions and processed them in community. We know our identity. And so we're asking, what now? And sometimes we're asking this what now while we're still kind of wandering in a kind of wilderness the wilderness of deconstruction. Because there are some things we have figured out and some things we don't have figured out and it just kind of feels like we're bumping up against ideas and we're not quite sure where we are. I would actually say that for me, I know that I am in a good place when I don't feel like I have everything figured out. When I'm able to access a humility that says I can live in tension, I can live in mystery, I know that I'm in a good place. And some may call that a wilderness, but that's okay. I'm okay with, with being a person who lives in tents, who lives in the wilderness. Because the wilderness of deconstruction is a holy place. I'll say that again. The wilderness of deconstruction is a holy place because it requires humility. It requires bravery, authenticity, and trust. Moses for 40 years lived among the Midianites, married to Zipporah, a Midianite woman, the daughter of, of a priest, Jethro, and he worked as a shepherd. I wonder what healing what awe for God was inspired, what amazing truths he pondered as he walked alongside and cared for the sheep. The Psalms give us a picture into the mind of the shepherd. David gives us prayers and praises to God and he offers laments and lessons on a life with God. Jesus as a good shepherd is and will always be one of my favorite pictures. So I wonder, Moses, shepherd, one called to leave the Israelites lead the Israelites to deliverance. I wonder what kind of things he thought, especially when his identity as a loved child of Yahweh was not in question. What happened? Well, scripture says that one day while Moses was leading the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over to see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. If you go on to read the account in Exodus 3 and 4, which I think you should, we'll see a few things about Moses' interaction with God. Moses goes on to have a conversation with God that I think many of us who are deconstructing and reconstructing have a lot to learn from. Moses was going about his business in the wilderness and God showed up. God called Moses by name and told him that he has seen, heard, and is moved by the suffering of his people. God reminds Moses of his covenant, his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God asks questions 
and Moses asks questions. They have a conversation. Moses has insecurities and God replies with assurance and a challenge to do what is right no matter what because he can trust God because God will be with him. This interaction is a picture of doubt and discernment. As we deconstruct and reconstruct, as we move out of boxes of order and into reorder, we need to know that God is the God of burning bush invitations. Times where questions and conversations are churning in our gut, it can feel like a deep fire within our bones. It's all we can think about, it's all we can talk about, it's all we can post about. And oftentimes these questions and thoughts, they feel like a desperate cry for clarity and certainty because they are. And we need deliverance, not from the doubt that God is good, we need deliverance from the certainty that we have to have everything figured out because Moses surely didn't have everything figured out. We see in Moses' conversation with God that God shows up for us in our doubts. And that's really important for our faith, that we can live a life of questioning and conversations with God and with others that that is a picture of a flourishing faith, a faith that has not given up, that's not afraid of doubt. When we allow ourselves to doubt, we allow ourselves to dream. You see, if I doubt that a good God wants to enact harm on people, then I've opened up a neural pathway to imagine what would or should God look like if God is truly good. Then I begin to explore that possibility. I begin to talk about it and read about it and look for it. And ultimately, I find that God is good because Jesus revealed the Father's character to us. We need doubt. We also need discernment. Discernment is the process of testing, asking, looking, confirming. Moses needed confirmation that his burning bush experience wasn't just some bad lamb he had the day before taking the flock out. This is why God revealing God's self and the covenant that he made and his name, I am that I am, matters. Moses could discern that this calling, this next step was from God because there were some non-negotiables for him. When we are deconstructing away from harmful theologies, we must have some standards, some essential things we cherish and will not let go. Around here, it's Jesus. We are Jesus-centered unapologetically and joyfully. This is why we're misfits, finding identity in Jesus. We don't just want to be known for what we are against and what we are not. We want to be known for who we are and who we're for and how his way is shaping us individually and as a community. And then the last aspect of deconstruction that we can learn from the Israelites in, in Exodus is determination we finally get to the Red Sea. Now one may say that Moses speaking truth to power and telling Pharaoh that God says, let my people go required some determination. I totally think it does. But there is a line in the account of the crossing of the Red Sea that really resonates with my journey of deconstruction. God says, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverer, the, you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. So many times in my own disordering and reordering, I've wavered. Did God really lead me to this resource or was that just me? Is God really this loving, this inclusive, this full of integrity, or am I making it all up? Am I teaching my kids a faith that is rooted in sound theology or am I raising little heretics? But I think about the Israelites who finally fled who follow God's directions about where to go and where to camp, who was guided by a pillar of fire to give them light in the darkness and a pillar of cloud to protect them from the sweltering heat of the wilderness. And I think, of course, God would lead them to cross a sea away from their enemy on dry land. Of course, they had spent weeks, months, years, generations, strengthening their faith muscles and communal discernment for this moment. Of course, God is and will always be with them. Our deconstruction is similar. We were guided by a loving call to protect us from the sweltering heat of theologies and practices that excluded and ignored the most basic need 
for human dignity and love. We were led by a pillar of fire to good teachers, patient teachers, teachers who opened our eyes to culturally relevant and humanizing theologies. We spent our wilderness in awe of God and pondering our own non-negotiables. And when we are faced with the red sea of doubt, rejection, opposition, from the even from people we love, we know we can trust God to make a way for us. We have spent so much time strengthening our faith muscles. Deconstruction does not have to be a, a death to your faith. Deconstruction can be a means and a way of strengthening your faith. Oftentimes, it looks like moving in community, this determination towards a good God, a loving theological framework. It looks like moving in community, trusting your community with your doubt and your fears, and being a voice of encouragement for each other around our non-negotiables, around finding our identity in Jesus. These things move us forward across the dry land and onto the other side and onto our promised land. I love the depiction of this moment in the movie, The Prince of Egypt, because if you watch it, you'll see the Israelites helping each other over the floor of the sea, over ridges and avoiding pitfalls, holding animals and children. This is why deconstruction should never be done in a vacuum or in isolation. We need each other because inevitably we'll have our own Red Sea encounters. When all those toxic ideas and worries come racing behind us, we need to know that God will drown them in his truth and love, and we need a community to lead us forward. So no matter where you are in your deconstruction and you're, and you're moving from the first box, the second box, or third box, wherever you are, misfit, and you're reordering, I want you to know that I'm praying for you. As one of your pastors, I'm here to listen to you and encourage you. TC and I love you all so much. And it's our hope that in this next season of Roots, that we grow together in our discipleship to Jesus from a place of deep confidence and hope. So let me close our time together with this pilgrimage prayer from Trinity Church in Pottsville. Almighty God, as we journey on this pilgrimage of life, lift our arms to help, strengthen our hearts to love, Fill our voices to sing. Open our minds to knowledge and truth. And help us to grow in service to your church and the world. With the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye, friends. Love you so much.